Look, fair warning, a big chunk of this review is going to be me comparing this to the original, even though I'm sure some people will tell me I just need to let it... Cold never bothered me anyway. All right, before we get into this, this one is sponsored by me and my own merch. Because uh, you may have noticed, I'm still get I'm still getting the full rollout going um, with pot with looking into updating titles or whatever. But I've got a new logo, and that means I've got new merch to slap that logo onto. If you go to Teespring, you can get a discount if you order between now and the end of Black Friday. Coupon codes down in the description. Check them out, use them. Wear my merch. You'll be cool, maybe? I don't know. You'll out yourself as a geek, at the very least. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, Frozen 2. I have seen it, took my kid to it, and... <sighs> okay. It brought to mind similar issues that I had with, say, Ralph Breaks the Internet, and to some extent, um, Incredibles 2. Although, I think to a lesser extent in both cases. I like this better than I think I liked either of those, but it really does pale in comparison to the original in a lot of key areas, or at least what were key areas for me and why I really liked the original Frozen. Now, depending on what it is you like about that first movie, your mileage may vary. And there are absolutely some very strong points of this film. The first thing, because this kind of matters, um, my kid liked it a lot. In fact, at least at the time of coming out of it, she says she thinks she likes it more than the original. Now, I can tell you from experience, she can be prisoner of the moment a little bit, and kind of the last thing she saw it tends to be her favorite thing, at least for a little bit. But she definitely had a good time. She had no issues, no complaints. So when I start getting into that end of things, which is also going to involve spoilers, but I will give you warning before I go there. Uh, when I start getting into that thing, it's very much going to be an adult's perspective of the things an adult liked about the previous one. So if you want to know if your kid will like it, yes, your kid will probably like it. And as far as what there is that is good about it, well, first of all, Look, it's gorgeous. This is a beautiful looking film. They came up with some really great, stunning, just amazing visual elements. I mean, the, the previous one was a good looking film as well, but they came up with some really good visual set pieces here, incorporating, you know, the some things that you've seen in the trailer with the ocean, the ice, and things like that. There's some amazing things done with fire that are really cool with this. And just overall, the design, the feel, the set pieces, really just gorgeous. Stunningly beautiful film. All the performances are solid. The singing's good, although the songs, I don't think they're as good. They're pretty good. Um, they, um, there's a song very clearly being positioned to be this film's Let It Go, um, and that one's called Into the Unknown, and that one's pretty good. I'm a little bit annoyed that that one's getting the big push because a later song called Show Yourself is actually a lot stronger, at least in my opinion. Um, but so other than that, the songs are well sung, not always as purposeful. I mean, th there were a couple of superfluous ish songs in the first one, but I felt that more strongly about more of the songs in this in terms of what the song was doing. Obviously, it's a musical. You don't have to have characters burst into songs, so they're all superfluous in a way, but in terms of feeling like this was the point to have a song and this is the thing a song in this story should be about, not everything quite clicked there. But again, performances are really solid. I was surprised how funny Olaf remains. The, oh God, the kids in the audience especially losing their minds at how much they laughed at Olaf. But even as an adult, I really kind of expected his shtick to have worn off on me by now. No, it was pretty. It was still pretty funny. I don't know what it is about that about that snowman. I'm actually not a huge fan of Josh Gad, but uh, this works. Not gonna lie. And yeah. 
anyone who isn't going to look at the deeper level of this thing, and that's not me saying like, if you like it, you're not looking at it deeply, but I'm saying if what you liked about the original was surface level, if what you liked was the songs, the images, the jokes, things like that, if those are your top reasons for liking the original Frozen, regardless of what your age is, you're gonna have a good time with this. However, if you're like me and you feel that the strongest thing that the original Frozen had going for it was narrative cohesion, that's not so much the case here. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think if there's a way for me to explain that without getting into spoilers. Well, there is and there isn't. I can lead into it spoiler-free, but I'm going to have to get into spoilers to get into explicit examples. So, let me explain what I mean about in the first film. The first film ha was incredibly strong thematically. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that, like, everything fed into a single theme. There were multiple themes going on, but they were themes that complemented each other and they fit together. So, you had... Elsa with a whole with a number of things going on with her in terms of repression of self and how the damage that can cause around you when inevitably it all kind of blows up. Her coming to believe that she can be accepted in the world with people who love her because she doesn't believe she can. And that is very much complemented by Anna's themes, which have to do with come, she has to come to terms with the fact that the world is not going to be this magical fairy tale where everything's perfect and ideal. And she has learning to do, Elsa has learning to do, the themes of their journeys knit together very well, and pretty much every other character factors into that in some way. Hans factors in as being the harshest lesson that Anna could have learned in terms of what the problem with her world outlook is. As far as Elsa goes, she has something very similar in that original one because her pushing people away almost gets her sister, actually, honestly, does get her sister killed. But then it is the mending of that rift and the familial love between them that saves her and brings her back. Even someone like Olaf has thematic relevance because his naivete is basically Anna's taken to an extreme when she's kind of, she has it shoved in her face like, oh, yeah, okay, there's a level of naivety that is a problem. And things just all fit together and complement each other and build on each other. And even things that seem like more superfluous, like, say, Bit of a Fixer Upper, actually, while not the strongest song in the thing, it has thematic relevance because part of Anna's journey is to realize that people are Fixer Uppers. It's not all perfect as is because she went out thinking, I'll just meet the perfect guy and everything will be wonderful. Like, no, that's not reality. You're not going to find that, but that doesn't mean that you don't have something that you can work with. So everything had thematic relevance to themes that were complementary to each other. The theming in Frozen 2 is... Honestly, first of all, it's a lot harder to pin down in the first place. I'm not going to call it devoid of themes. They are there, but they don't build on each other. And the various elements of the film, including the songs and especially including the magical elements, don't complement and strengthen the themes in the way that they did in the original. In fact, in some cases, they feel like they undercut them in a way that isn't quite working, or at the very least, they muddle and confuse them. There are things about the way that the magic and the fantastical elements in this work that if it is intended to relate to the themes that I'm seeing, I can't figure out how, which means I'm either misreading the themes or there's something else going on that I'm missing, or they just flat out don't connect. And honestly, some of what's going on here is things that are fairly common if you try and do a sequel to a film with a very strong thematic core, which is in that previous film, things that were there were there because they built up the themes, where when you come to the sequel, things are there because, well, it was in the previous film, so we got to bring it back, uh, even though their role in it doesn't complement the overall thing. Unfortunately, Kristoff is a really good example of that. His whole thing going on with him is incredibly disconnected from everything else going on. And his song that he gets called Lost in the Woods, which is a decent song in and of itself, was really jarring. I'm sitting there thinking, like, this, like, this is your issue, dude? Like, really? Time and place, man. Come on. And, yeah, no, it didn't, 
it didn't work. And I do need to start getting spoilers because I need to start talking specifics. So from here on out, there be spoilers. Ye be warned. I don't know why I just became a pirate there, but we're rolling with it. Okay. So I brought up the magic, and I'm going to complain a bit about the magic. And I want people to understand that my complaints about the magic are thematic, not logistical. The original film, the logic didn't totally flow in terms of what the rules of this magic is and how it works and what the limitations of it are. Because as far as Elsa's powers, you know, she just makes cold and creates ice, but then she can, like, also control it and build a castle and, like, create life with Marshmallow and all of, like, that, it, it doesn't make total logical sense, but it makes thematic sense in, in pretty much every case. Especially when you consider that Olaf, like I said, is a bit of an exaggeration of Anna, and Marshmallow is basically an exaggeration of Elsa. Her, her desire to be alone and to push everyone away, and Elsa's, um, you know, desire to just get everyone together and have warm hugs. So everything fit thematically, even if you could poke logistical holes into it. This time, the logistical holes, I'm not sure, are that much worse than they were in the first film, but because they don't have the thematic backing, they bothered me here in a way they didn't bother me in the original. And part of that is that they add a heck of a lot more magic. Because Elsa was really the only magical element in play in the first one, they kind of got away with playing fast and loose. But the more magical elements you involve in something, the more you kind of need to parse out, wait, how does this work again? And they kind of don't. And normally I don't really need an explanation, but the lack of explanation or the tiny scant bits we get, again, muddles the theming, especially when there are implications of the desires of nature and this nebulous idea of spirits. And basically there's a motivation. The magical forces of the world have a motive and they want a thing, which kind of means you need to tie it all together and explain it a little bit better. Once something starts acting with motive, it can no longer be just a thing that happens. It's a, it's effectively a character now. And so that, I don't feel that really got done. And so some of the logistical stuff that I, I don't think would have bothered me so much if I felt the theming was stronger are things like, okay, so, and like I said, spoilers, Elsa gets this call, she hears this song that no one else hears. Well, we find out that that is kind of her mother, but it's kind of just the memory of her mother, which first of all, once we get the explanation of that, why can't Anna hear it? Because Elsa doesn't have any particularly stronger connection to her mother than Anna would have, so we don't know that. Why is Elsa only hearing this now? What triggered it for her to hear it now as opposed to at any other point previously? Why didn't she hear it when she was all by herself with zero distractions up in her ice palace in that stretch of the previous film? Again, I'm not sure it actually matters for an answer, but these things are jumping out at me because I'm not flowing with the overall thing. I think it also helps that the previous film had a very clear issue to deal with. You know, Kingdom Frozen, unthaw, unthaw Kingdom. How do we do that? Go deal with Elsa. Cool. Problem, clear path for how we at least think we're going to deal with this. This one, Elsa feels a pull to someplace. Okay. And there are apparently now spirits released, which she did by accident, but maybe it's bad. Maybe it's not. Okay. Um, she'll learn something about her past and her parents. Uh, okay. Like, th there's no clear mission to what they're doing. And by the time they get one, it's very late in the game. And, uh, and so, like, here's what I mean about weak thematic elements. When Elsa gets to the, I forget what they call it, but she gets to the place at the end, and I know they'd set up the whole thing about you go too deep, you drown, or whatever, but thematically, what is this saying? If you, un, if you reveal too much of your own past history, it kills you? Except that her finding that stuff out, which first of all is kind of a, kind of a weak reveal because it's a reveal and a twist about somebody that neither Anna nor Elsa ever actually knew in real life anyways. But like that knowledge also empowered Anna to do the thing that needed to happen that was the good thing, but it was bad because Elsa 
died, and Anna calls it a sacrifice, except it's not, because Elsa wasn't planning to die to find that out. She just did it, and that happened to kill her? Temporarily, of course. Um, which also... In it also annoys me that we get two fake out death and revivals. One, fine, we had one last time, but to do it with both her and Olaf, it's a little cheap. But, like, thematically, that's, that's a mess. What is that saying? And I don't hold that standard to any film, but when you're following up on a film where there are thematic answers to Basically, any question where you ask, wait, why is it this way? Because maybe the logistics don't make total sense. There's a thematic answer that you can give. This one, there isn't for a lot of these things. At least not that I can find. And also, talking about weakening stuff. So, Anna's big decision and her big moment and like... Look, let me be clear. I really like the sentiment of do the next good thing. The next best thing, what whatever it is. It's like, if you don't know where you're going long term, just look at the short term. What is the best thing that I can do right now? So do that. I actually really like that as a message. But again, it's a message of like a song and like one other thing. And it's, it doesn't, it doesn't get built as a major through line for Anna as a character, the way her development of the first one did. So again, comparatively just annoys me. Anyways, God... Huh, okay, maybe this thing did irritate me a little bit more than I let on at the beginning. But anyways, let, let, let me get there. So, Anna makes this whole revelation that they need to break the dam. Because the dam was not built to bring two kingdoms together. It was built in order to weaken one kingdom. So that her, that her kingdom, Arendelle, could basically control them. And she realizes we have to break this dam. But she already knows breaking the dam will flood Arendelle. Now, her decision to do that is difficult for her, but is relieved by she knows the town's already, the kingdom, the city has already been evacuated. There are no human beings there. They will lose the their homes, but that can be rebuilt. The people are safe. And yet Anna comes to, I'm sorry, Elsa comes to, comes, gets revived and stops it and the kingdom saved. But there's no tension in that because there were no people left there. And it undermines uh, the decision that Anna made because she made the hard choice. I'm going to cause destruction in the interest of something more important. But then the destruction doesn't happen. A sacrifice isn't worth much if, in the end, you actually didn't have to sacrifice anything. Again, really, really, really weak thematically. And... Just, <sighs> it was just frustrating. And again, not because it's bad in and of itself. Take it as a film unto itself, it's fine. But I'm gonna hold it to a higher standard on these layers, on these depths, on the thematic elements, because that, for me, was what made the first film truly great. I did like the more superficial stuff. I did like the characters and the, and you know, the performances of them and the songs and the visuals. And it was funny when it wanted to be. I enjoyed all that. But why I truly loved the first one was the thematic depth to it. And that is not here. It's not an absence of themes, but it is an absence of... Of, of them being anywhere nearly as well-structured, as complementary, and as cohesive as they were in the first film. And if you're going to do a sequel to a previous film that, that, that was as thematically tight as Frozen was, well, I'm going to hold you to that standard. And by that standard, this thing falls woefully short. Your kids will love it. But if you're like me, and you love the original for its depth and how well thought out its thematic strengths were, you will find this one sorely lacking in anything other than the most superficial elements of visuals and humor and song, which are all strong, but for me, not enough. So, I really hope, I really, really hope, that Disney can be done with sequels for a while uh, to their animated films. They seem to be. Like, there's no sequels on the docket for a while. And also, I want to stress, sequels don't always have to be things completely falling apart. I was shocked how much I liked Toy Story 4. 
and Lego Movie 2. Just to use examples from earlier this year. But this, Wreck-It Ralph 2, just no. No, no, no. D Disney, give it a rest. Okay, because especially with, with the with films that everything came together as well as it did. Ah, yeah, it's just, it, it was a bit of a frustrating experience for me. So that's Frozen 2. You've seen it? What'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Bunch of stuff to do down there as well. Because there's buttons and links. The merch, which I mentioned at the top of the whole thing. All of that. Check it out. Help me out. Patreon, etc., etc. Or don't. You don't have to. Because at the end of the day, you're the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.